Answers in Genesis, that's the curriculum we use for the Sunday school. Very good, They're, they are solid as a rock. Um, and, uh, and they obviously came up with this whole theme for the, the VBS. And so if you're not familiar with Answers in Genesis, if you are familiar with Answers in Genesis, you know that that's headed by a man named Ken Ham. Ken Ham happens to be from? Australia. Australia. Australia mates. Yeah, I don't think it's any coincidence that, uh, that this has all got an Australian theme coming out of Answers in Genesis. So anyway, but they are, they are very good. They have, they have got a very good curriculum and are very solid on the Word of God and the foundations taught in the first, I think, nine chapters is what they stand on, nine chapters of Genesis. So um, very good. But um, so I'm going to be, I got, I got a couple tasks at hand here today. Um, we have to, uh, we're going to go through, I'm going to do a little short teaching on, on children and what the Bible says about children. Then we're going to do a, a short teaching on baptism. And then we're going to go outside and do a baptism. Uh, and we're going to try to have all that done by 1130. So I got, I got to try and keep these uh, short. So and <laughs> <laughs> to try to make that, you know, maybe like 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and 15 minutes outside. So, so um, when we're finished in here, uh, you know, go outside, go out the back, the back, you know, the downstairs hallway. You can go up and over if you want. Go down the stairway, or you can go downstairs and around through the downstairs hallway, and out the back door. Find yourself a place. There is a baptismal setup to the right side of the shelter down there, and that's where we'll be doing the <laughs> baptism. Okay. So, um, so yeah, National Children's Day. I, I'm actually uh, was asked to fill in by Pastor Ritt again. Uh, if you don't know, um, a good friend of his that was instrumental in leading him to the Lord passed away, and he's up in New York uh, facilitating the, the, the funeral. So that's why he's not here again today. So he asked me if I would cover and do a message on, on, uh, on children. And, and National Children's Day. And, you know, I had to think about that. National Children's Day. What is National Children's Day? And um, we were just kind of looking at some of the origins of it. And, you know, it was implemented worldwide by the UN in 1990. That probably tells you something right there. Um, National Children's Day has got a very humanistic background uh, or uh, origination. Uh, and, and so, you know, if you if you don't have your well, let's just put it as if you if you have your eyes open, uh, it's very easy to see that there's a problem with our youth in this country, um, and and a lot of it I think is because of a lot of the humanistic type you know ideology that's been you know been channeled down through the society, and basically give the kids everything, give kids everything, 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 everything I get them everything they want. Uh, the very entitled generation and they're you know they're they're growing up into uh you know children have lots of problems a lot of mental problems and you know we're seeing we're we are now reaping what we've sown and you know and we're all familiar with uh, you know some of the more current events and the just the tragedies that are surrounding that and you know i was just thinking about you know boy back you know you go back just a couple generations and even to my generation in um um you know whatever, elementary school, middle school, high school, and, you know, the big problem back then, and some of you are even older, the big problem then was what, you know, chewing gum or talking in class. You know, there was no such thing as metal detectors and school shootings and things like that. That just didn't happen. And uh, so, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the narrative is, you know, guns, 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 guns. Well, why is no one asking the question, <laughs> why is this occurring? Why, why, I mean, it's, you know, that's just a tool in the hand of someone that's going to, has got a problem, right? He's got some serious problems. So anyways, um, with that kind of in the backdrop, I, I wanted to take a look at, um, you know, what the Bible says about children. And, and the first off, um, you know, it, it's, well, let's just, let's turn to Psalm 127 and we'll, we'll look really quick what it says there. You know, the, the, we want to bless our children, right? Um, but we don't want to entitle them. Uh, we want them to grow up and have wonderful child, you know, childhood years. Um, 
But, you know, the, the position here at this church and, and being, you know, promoted by, by Anthony and Veronica is that, yeah, we want to bless the children, but there will always be a foundation of the, of the Lord Jesus and the Bible. And that's what they really, really need, right? And I think the problem is that we're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of children that are just getting everything, 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 and there's no real foundation. They, be, they grow up into this, you know, this entitlement generation. Uh, and you think back about, you look, think of some of the stories that are in the Bible, and, you know, when kids were just very young, at a very young age, they were out in the field working with their parents. You know, they had, they were, had responsibilities. They didn't just have everything given to them on a, on a platter. They were expected to be part of a functional family and a functional society. Uh, and, you know, when we were talking about that before service and Darren, Darren says, well, but, you know, they'll, they'll use the argument, yeah, but, you know, the, the people only live till 40 then. You know, and I said, well, yeah, now, now those kids live in the basement playing video games till they're 40, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's a serious problem there, right? But anyway, so what does the Bible say about children? Uh, and Lord, we just ask you that you would go before uh, me in this message. And Lord, that we would uh, keep uh, all these things in the context of what you said in your word. And Lord, it is all designed for our good, uh, the good of our families, the good of our children, the good of our society, Lord. So just bless us as we go through these scriptures. Thank you, Jesus. And we ask it in your name. Amen. 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 So Psalm 127 says... Uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. So children are a heritage. They're given to them. They're the fruit of the womb, right? Fruit speaks of something that's good, right? Uh, and, uh, and they're a reward. And, and they're, like, they're like arrows in the quiver. I mean, this, this is good. They're like a defense for us, right? Um, they are our future. They are the livelihood of, of what we have to look forward to. Um, you know, good grounded children. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. So is the Lord uh, God, he's, he's for children, right? Yeah, he's obviously, he's for children. I mean, that, that just that is almost like a stupid rhetorical question, right? Is God for children? Of course he is. Uh, but you remember in, in the Gospel of Matthew when, when they were bringing the children to Jesus, what were, they, what were they doing? No, 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 keep them away. And so it says in Matthew 19 and verses 13 to 15, it says, Then the little children were brought to him, him being Jesus, that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, here's another one. This goes into Psalm 128, which come, oh no, it's 139, sorry. Um, one, Psalm 128, it's a song of ascents. It says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways when you eat the labor of your hands. You shall be happy and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So children here in this particular text are likened to uh, olive branches, right? Uh, olive sprouts. That, I mean, that's a good thing, right? That's not a, that's not a negative thing. They're, they're promoted in a good light. Children are a blessing. Uh, they're, and they're around their table. Your table's full of around these olive, plant, uh, olive, olive plants, and that's a very good thing to have. Um, all your days of life, yes, may you see your children's children. And praise God for that. Amen. Um, so blessed by that. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. So children's children is the crown of old men. And, and I tell you, it, it, you know, we, we long for the day to be grandparents, and, and we are, Frankie and myself, are very blessed to, to have a um, grandchild up in Ohio from my son and, and daughter-in-law. And my other son is 
currently uh, very close to completing the adoption of their little foster daughter. Uh, that has now been scheduled for the court hearing and it looks like that will be done probably within the month. And so finally, because it's taken like years for this to happen, it's just amazing how long it takes them to do anything. So this little girl's been placed in their house for a couple of years, and and now finally we're coming to where um, you know we'll have a little a little another little granddaughter, and I got all I got all girls all all girls and and you know and and you know Nathan and Sarah being my niece and nephew have the four little ones and they're they're grandchildren to me, yeah they're just such a blessing they're such a blessing, children's children the crown of the old man. Um, and then in Matthew 18, 6, it says, But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. In 18, 10, he says, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So... Very, very important children are, and God sees them and highly regards them. And boy, you know, calls one of these little ones to sin, and um, yeah, tie a millstone around your neck and drop you in. But so that's you know some of the good things the Bible has to say. But there's really two primary themes that are throughout. I can't believe it's already five. <laughs> there's no way I'm going to get this done. Um, yeah, uh, two primary themes regarding children throughout the Bible. Uh, and, and I can tell you, it's not amusing them, right? And, and it is not to uh, cater to their every whim or their every desire. That's not the two themes. The two themes that reoccur throughout Scripture over and over and over regarding children are discipline and training. Training and discipline, those are the two things that occur over and over and over. Uh, and they are the two primary themes. If you go through and you look up, look up children and go through and look at all the text on children, they are almost, well, it did, I'm going to say disregard. Um, the, the word children is used quite a bit when you're talking about the children of Israel, the children of Israel. That's used a lot. But we're actually talking about children, you know, little, little ones. The two themes regarding that is, uh, is training and discipline. If you remember back in Psalm 128, in verse 3, it said, Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. I found this quote uh, from a, a man named Joseph Stephan uh, from an organization, The Sufficiency of Scripture. I said, Children are likened to olive plants. Olive plants, if not pruned and controlled, become a wild nuisance. On the other hand, small olive plants that are nurtured and trained in the way they should grow do not grow wild and do not have scars from pruning since the pruning is done while they were very young and tender. The later you do the training, the more scars they will have and the less likely there will be success in directing their growth. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty, pretty good quote. So let's look at some of the verses regarding training. We'll start with there. And I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. Um, and I, I'll just say this, that th this is a topic that we could spend weeks on. You know, training, discipline, raising children. So what we're going to do, what we're planning on doing, the marriage retreat is coming up in, in uh, this fall. And then after the marriage retreat, we're going to follow that up with actual marriage class. Um, for some duration of time. I'm not sure exactly how long that will go on, but there will be a marriage class. And then following the marriage class, we want to do a parenting class. All right, and so we're going to do those, those things. And you know, the, marriage, the marriage classes and the marriage retreat are very important because, and we'll, we'll see this in one of the texts that we will uh, get to here, that it's actually, well, I'm going to jump ahead here. Um, it's very important because really the, the husband and wife have to be one, right, in their marriage and their, and their, and their beliefs and what they're planning and their, you know, how, they, how they're going to raise their children. Uh, if they're not one, you know how kids are, you know, uh, hey, mommy, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? Uh, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. Hey, daddy, hey, daddy, can I, can I, can I, can I? So, I mean, they, and they, they're, they're perfect. They know exactly how to, you know, get what they want and how to, um, you know, bid each other, bid the parents against each other. Uh, so uh, th it's very important that the husband and wife are one in their, in their plan for parenting. 
So we're gonna do that. We'll do the marriage retreat, marriage class, and then a, and then a parenting class. All right, so primary text uh, on training. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. So you're not supposed to give them things that they can't possibly accomplish and then chastise them for it. Uh, that would do nothing but frustrate them and bring them to wrath. Uh, but you are to do what? Bring them up in the what? Training and admonition of the, of the Lord. So the training is in the, the Lord. See this reoccurring theme. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, this is the only text on training that I could find that didn't specifically say the training is in the Lord. Okay? But it does speak that if you see a child, uh, you're watching your child as they grow, and, and you're taking note of their different dispositions, and, and, and you'll see their strengths and their weaknesses, and you're to train them up and, and promote them into the way that is, you know, is a strength in their life and in their most, uh, in their most likelihood of succeeding in life. Uh, so train them up in the way they should go. But get this one, Malachi 2.15 2, uh, says, But did he, God, not make them, husband and wife, did he not make them one? So this is why I was talking about how important the um, marriage relationship is. Did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? Because he seeks godly offspring. So that's why God does done this. He wants the parents to be one in, in all their decisions they're making regarding the raising of their children, because if you do that, you will have godly offspring. Deuteronomy 4, 8 to 11. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law, which I set before you this day, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, and when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. So what are they to teach their children? The fear of the Lord. And what, what was given on the Mount Horeb? Yeah, God's word. I mean, that's where God was speaking to Moses and that's where the law was given. So example of a person in the Bible who was uh, raised and he was taught the precepts of the Bible from a very young age. That would be Timothy. And if we look at 2 Timothy in chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt, dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded is also in you. And then he goes on later in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, but, to you, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing that from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the grandmother, the mother, they're imparting the word continually into Timothy. And he says, from childhood, you knew these scriptures. You knew them. So that, again, the training, the training, the training is moral. We have to fill, and this is something that we take, talk about in the, um, the parenting class. We have to fill the moral warehouse. You think of your kids of, of being this, when they're born, they're this warehouse, and it's vacant. There's nothing in there. What you put into that warehouse, when that child grows up and it has to call something to recollection, the only place it has to go is into the warehouse. That's the only place it can go. I have to, oh, how am I going to deal with that? What's, what's in my warehouse? Right? Um, for example, if you're training them rightly uh, and they happen to be on a crowded bus going somewhere, uh, and the bus stops at the next stop, and it's crowded, it's full, there's no seats. And um, the door opens, and a little elderly lady gets on the bus. 
the moral warehouse should go, I should get up and give my seat. But that's only in the moral warehouse if it's been put into the moral warehouse, right? So the child would, would sit there and they would, they would watch the situation occur and instantly they'd look into the moral warehouse, beep, 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 boom, get up, move out, get out of the way, let this person take my seat, I'll stand, right? So that's what I'm talking about, the moral warehouse. Things have to be put into that moral warehouse. Uh, another one, I mean, and you see this happen all the time, and, it, and sometimes it happens, I mean, it's happened to me, uh, not that it's a big deal, um, but, but uh, you know, you're walking up to a store or a door or something like that, and, and you know, you see someone that's coming up behind you or something that's coming out, um, and, and what do you do? You open the door and you let the person walk out or, or you open the door up and you, and you hold it for the person that's coming behind you or whatever, right? How many times have you, have you walked up and, and there's someone in front of you, they open the door and they just slam and, and you're like this far away, you know? And, and you're like, wow, okay. You know, it's because it's nothing in the moral warehouse. Major tangent here. Um, <laughs> but these are the things we'll be talking about. These kind of things we'll be talking about in the parenting class. Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9 says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command, me, command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. This same narrative is repeated later in Deuteronomy in, in um, chapter 11, 8 to verses 21, he says the exact same thing over. The, you need to be teaching these things to your children, your children's children, your children. It, it, it promotes this being done by the grandparents as well. Teach them in your house, when you sit down, when you rise up, when you walk by the wayside, you should be finding opportunities to fill your children's moral warehouse with the word of God. That's what it's promoting. And then discipline, the second one. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because the sentence against evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So discipline is a form of training, right? So I said training and discipline, but discipline in itself is a form of training. Uh, the first training we were talking about is, is, is a positive. You're giving them the good stuff, positive, positive, positive. But sometimes your kids do things that are wrong and they need to have the negative, all right? <laughs> um, you know, timeout's not in the Bible, by the way. Uh, <laughs> unless, of course, the timeout happens to be over your knee. Um, I think the timeout's for us to take a deep breath. Yeah, well, and that's a good thing. Actually, that's, for, that's, that's a good thing. So, uh, you know, there is the, the discipline um, is like a corporal punishment that, that we see throughout the, the, um, throughout the Bible. It's, a, it's normally a spanking of something to that effect, but you don't ever want to do it in anger. You know, if, 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 they, if you're beside yourself, number one, you let the situation get too far out of control yourself, all right, because you didn't execute it speedily, and now it's, you know, gotten you to a place where you're exasperated. Um, so you, you want to execute speedily, uh, and you don't want to get yourself to a place where, you know, now, I, I mean, and you, again, you've seen this, you've probably seen it in the store where the kids, you know, and all of a sudden finally just whack, you know, the parent walks over and just gives them a whack. Have you seen that? I've seen it, you know, that's not right. That's not discipline. That's whacking your kid, 
all right? Yeah, that's frustrated, and you're taking something out, your frustration out on them. That is not the purpose of discipline. So when the Bible talks about the rod and beating and things like that, it's not talking about, you know, abusing them and hurting them intentionally. It's talking about executing a corporal-type punishment for them because it removes the foolishness out of them, but it is done in a cool, collected, and calm manner. Never out of frustration or anger, ever, ever. So if you need a timeout, take the timeout, all right, and then deal with it. But you need to do it speedily, all right? Proverbs 13, 24, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him properly. Uh, 22, 15, Proverbs says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13 to 14, do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 29, 15 says, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 17, correct your, your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. And finally, Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, and you, have, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to us as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which we have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our own profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems joyful to, for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness who have been trained by it. And that is our objective when we are training and disciplining our children. We want the peaceable fruit of righteousness to come through, right? We want them to be a joy and a blessing to our family, to our friends, to our community. Okay, and that's what we're, that is our objective. <clears throat> So what's the child's responsibility? What's the Bible say about the child's responsibility? It's a long list, a really long list, a huge long list, right? My son, keep your father's command. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. Keep their, your father and mother's command. Uh, in fact, commandment number five. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God is giving you. Honor your father and mother. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long upon the earth. Very short list for your kids. All they got to do is honor you and obey. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty simple. But that's what you're trying to bring them to. You're trying to bring them to the place where they will honor you and that they will be a blessing to your household and not little tyrants. Okay? Little tyrants grow into big tyrants. And, and then it's too late. And boy, like, you know, that, that quote that I read, you're going to try to start now uh, disciplining your child when they're past that age of where it really isn't effective. All you're going to do is scar them. And, and it's going to cause lots and lots of problems. So you got to start when they're little. Okay, start when they're little. And, and you can do this. And uh, you're bringing them to where they will honor you and obey and be a blessing. That's the objective. That's, that's what I have that I got out of the Word of God on, on regarding children. And that's a lot. And we went through a lot very fast. We will break a lot of this down uh, when we do the uh, parenting class in the fall. So now um, I need to turn my attention to baptism uh, because we want to do a baptism outside. And actually, I really was wanting to be outside by about right now. Um, so I'm a little bit behind already. Uh, but just, uh, just another note. 
on, on the, the children, children thing, because that Hebrews thing that we, the Hebrews text that we just read here at, at the end, uh, he's not only referring to little children in that, right? He's referring to children of God, his children. And, and the chastening will be brought to us as well, just as, and, and it's, it's legitimate chastening. And so we have, as children of God, we, we are going to need to be chastened. And what are we going to do with that chastening when it comes our way? Are we going to despise it? Or are we going to say, okay, Lord, what are you trying to do? What are you, going to, what are you trying to do? In my, what, you know, what do I need to change? What, what am I doing that's wrong? And allow God to work in you so that he can not only bring, you know, peaceful fruits of righteousness to your little ones, but bring peaceful fruits of righteousness to yourself. Because that's that is what his aim is as well. And as children of God, we're, we're, we talked about this last week when we were um, going through the text. Uh, we become children of God by what? By the seed of by Abraham, by faith, right? We become children of God. And so as a child of God, we are left with a couple ordinances uh, that we're supposed to partake in as children. And one of them is, which we do it once every month, um, on a Wednesday night is communion. And the other one is baptism. Of course, that's what we're talking about, baptism. So I had, I had a whole thing I wanted to kind of go through and develop here with baptism something that I was reading the other day and I thought it was very interesting. Um, it, it basically is a, a vision of what happens when something goes into the water and what happens when it comes out of the water. And this is all biblical text. I thought it was very interesting. That, and I was like, wow, I never, I never saw that before or, or realized that. But it all starts in Genesis, right? So let me read this real quick. Genesis 1, 1 to 13, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And so it was. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And so it was. And God called the dry land earth and it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs that yield seed and fruit, the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And so it was. And each brought forth grass and herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the third day. So it wasn't until the earth rose out of the water that there was any ability for life to occur on the planet. There was no plant, there was no life until after the earth rose up out of the water. Isn't that interesting? In Genesis 6, 13, 6, 13 to 18, it says, And God said to Noah, let all the flesh, uh, let the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits and its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with a lower second and third decks. And behold, I myself have bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh, which is the breath of life. Everything that is on earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. So essentially God's man, or, sorry, essentially man's wickedness comes and God destroys the earth. He basically took the earth back to day three when it was underwater. Okay. Before the, before the earth came up out of the water, there was no earth. Day three, the flood comes, he puts it back underwater, right? Now it's underwater and only a remnant goes through the water, comes through the water and reestablishes 
life on earth. All right? So it's not until the water goes back down that life now has started over. And very interesting that when Noah is, is looking for the time to, to come out of the ark, what does he let go? A dove. Yeah. And coincidentally, when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, what appears? A dove. Isn't that coincidentally, isn't that kind of neat? And all these little coincidences, right? And there's no coincidence in the Bible, right? Goes back to day three, but life doesn't come until after the, earth, the water recedes and the earth can then be repopulated. But a remnant is now taken through. We see this again with the Red Sea crossing. God took Israel through the water, and it wasn't until they came up on the other side that they basically celebrated that this life. Now we see coming up out of the water that their bondage has been removed from them, right? They've been released from the slavery and the bondage of Israel, I mean, of, of Egypt. He did it again when, when he led Joshua across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. <clears throat> Once again, they walk across through the water. The water stands up as a heap. And then when they cross through the water, they end up in the land of milk and honey. All right. Very interesting. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but note in Isaiah, in Isaiah 43, it says, But now, thus says the Lord who created you, Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. So here we see another picture of passing through the water. For the remnant, the water is not going to take you out. He will be with you. He will take you through it. All right? What comes out the other side is going to be more beautiful than what went in. All right? So then we see in the New Testament, this guy comes along, and his name is John the Baptist. And where do we see John the Baptist? We see him at the Jordan River. All right? And what is he doing? He's baptizing to repentance. In Matthew 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits of, worthy of repentance, and do not think to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these very stones. Those very stones, by the way, are the memorial stones that Joshua placed at the Jordan River when they crossed. So again, a little coincidence, right? Coming through the river. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his th threshing floor and gather his weed into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And, Jordan, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him, and when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighted upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So what happened when Jesus came up out of the water? The heavens opened. The heavens opened and the Spirit descended like a dove. So here we have this picture of this baptism, and, and it's three years later from this point on 
Jesus now goes through the trials that he's going to go through. And he's going to be scourged and he's going to be murdered. And he's going to be put to death and he's going to be separated from the Father. But what happens on the other side? Not only life for him, but eternal life for all of us. So everything that goes through the water, what comes out on the other side is always better. So what does all this mean? The Bible ties a lot of these events together and it ties them together with baptism. In 1 Peter, it's in 3:18 to 22, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through the water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So here we go. Peter ties the event of Noah, Noah's ark, going through the water to baptism and coming through the water into eternal life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 and 2 says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He ties the Red Sea crossing into baptism and what comes out is the rejoicing of the goodness of God on the other side. And then finally, you can turn to chapter 6 of Romans where Paul pretty much now explains to us exactly what this baptism is. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there it is. There's the picture of baptism. We are identifying with the likeness of Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We die to sin and we go into the water. We go into the water as dead. But what comes up out of the water? Life. A life everlasting. A life that will no longer perish. Because it is no longer a physical life. It is now a spiritual life. A spiritual life that has been changed, that has been touched by God, and now has everlasting life. The key is that it has to be a life that's been touched by God. There has to be a renewal of the spirit. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, all was, or before they sinned in the garden, all was good. And he said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree, because if you do, you shall surely die. He wasn't just speaking of a physical death. He was speaking of a, phys a spiritual death. And until Christ came, and died and resurrected from the dead. There was no hope 
for a spiritual life, everlasting life in heaven with God. But now it's the exchange life. If you remember, after Jesus rose from the dead and he met them in the upper, he met the disciples in the upper room, what did he do? He breathed on them. And he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. When Adam and Eve, when Adam was, before Adam was created, he was created from the dust of the earth. So right now, he's just a bunch of dirt. But what did God do? He breathed his breath of life into Adam. And Adam now had life. And when Adam sinned, and Adam and Eve sinned, and they turned from God, that life, that spiritual life was cut off. And the spiritual life was not renewed until Jesus came back, rose from the dead, met the disciples in the upper room. And breathed his breath of life. Died and resurrected. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. John said, I baptize you to repentance, but there will be one who will come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That is, the, that is what the symbol, the symbol of baptism is. We don't believe there's any hocus pocus. We don't believe that there's any um, washing away of original sin or any regeneration that occurs. There's no salvation that occurs because you're being baptized. The Bible doesn't teach that. As Peter, we read in Peter, it is the answer of a good conscience towards God. God has done a work in you. He has breathed his spirit into you. You know it. You recognize it. And now your answer to him and identification of your new life with him is I'm going to go in the water symbolizing my death and my resurrection to new life. Amen? Amen. And then, so we're going to do that. And I am over by 15 minutes, so uh, we're going to quickly uh, go outside um, and gather underneath the pavilion. I'm going to change really quick, and I will meet you out there just as soon as I can get out there. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just pray that you will bless this time this afternoon as we have uh, enjoy a lunch and fellowship and, uh, and just um, some nutrition and some fun and games and all the things that are going to go on. Keep us safe uh, and then let that spirit um, reign, this conversation of your spirit reign throughout the, the, the conversations today. And Lord, I just pray that you will bless, bless the baptism. And uh, just be with us, Lord, and just touch our hearts. Thank you, Lord. In your precious name, amen. Amen.